So um, my, my particular uh, focus of research, among others, is the uh, is early Roman drama, and that's obviously where I've taken this paper from. And I'm going to give you a bit of introduction before I start with some examples, because I don't expect everyone to be absolutely familiar with all these dramas that only survive in fragments. So let's get going. Um, so according, uh, 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 let me just... Um, yeah, according to the Roman, uh, ancient Romans' own tradition, which survives in some of the ancient historians, Roman drama, in, in the sense of performances according to scripted stories with a plot, came into being in ancient Rome in about 240 BC, which is the year after the completion of the First Punic War, when a play or, or several plays were first commissioned from a playwright for performance at the state organized festivals. From then onwards, a flourishing culture of dramatic performances and production of dramatic script developed over the rest of the Republican period until the end of the first century BC. Indeed, there must have been a substantial number of dramas since originally new plays were composed for the productions of each festival as revival performances became only established at a later stage. The modern view, however, of this vibrant uh, performance culture is somewhat skewed because of the vagaries of transmission. Out of all those plays that must have been written and performed, only some of two playwrights, both active in the same dramatic genre, survive in full or almost in full, that is, 20 Greek style comedies by Plautus and six by Terence. The evidence for all other playwrights and all other dramatic genres, and also some further plays by Plautus, has been transmitted as fragments and testimonia only. These pieces of information, these testimonia and fragments, all come from the so called secondary transmission. That is, we know them because they are quotations in the text of later classical and late antique ancient authors. Thus, when exploring early Roman literature, one is really at the mercy of the quoting authors, who might have selected items following their own agendas and or misquoted them or left out bits and pieces and uh, other problems uh, uh, that, uh, that may occur. A similar situation applies to the transmission of works of most other literary genres from the early Republican period, as almost all literature from this period is now fragmentary. Since drama paradigmatically illustrates the issues connected with this transmission situation, and also raises further questions linked to the tension between orality, performance and writing culture, this literary genre will here be used as a case study to illustrate first the ways of preservation of these dramatic scripts and the engagement with drama in antiquity, uh, and, uh, and then the forms of transmission and their impact on the modern views of Roman drama and on ways of approaching it. The brief overview of these points on the basis of selected examples should finally allow us some conclusions on the nature of the transmission of early Roman literature and the consequences of this transmission for the development and assessment of Roman literary history. Since originally new plays were composed for each festival featuring dramatic productions, dramatic scripts were produced by playwrights for those occasions. These scripts mainly served practical purposes namely to inform organizing officials of the content of planned plays, and then to guide actor managers, producers, actors, and musicians in getting plays ready for production. These scripts were merely taxed with the utterances of the characters. They did not include explicit stage directions other than those implied in what characters are saying. And while the lines were written in varying meters indicating rhythmical patterns, the scripts did not include the accompanying music, an important element of early Roman drama. Thus, details of the staging and the music were added by the performers when scripts were transformed into dramatic productions. Indeed, once playwrights had handed over the scripts to the production troupe, they basically lost control of them 
because the same ideas of copyright that we have now, they didn't exist in antiquity. Actor managers then took charge of the scripts and it is assumed that the scripts remained in their position while they would not have entered wider circulation initially. Thus, most of the public would be able to experience plays only when attending a performance or when hearing reports about performances. Because scripts must have been preserved by theatre people, it became possible to stage revival performances of popular plays from the middle of the second century BC onwards. These revivals were not necessarily exact reproductions of the original plays. For one of Plato's plays, the play Kazana, for instance, it is obvious that the surviving prologue, of which you see the main part here, is a version written for a later performance. When it is said about in the middle of this extract, that this play had been chosen for performance since audiences like and prefer the old plays. These are the plays by Plautus and his contemporaries. As I said, in Republican Rome, there was no concept of intellectual property and copyright. Scripts were regarded as working drafts to enable performances. Accordingly, subsequent actors' troops could revive existing plays and adjust them in line with their current needs and requirements. In this period, the general public continued to engage with plays by watching performances, since the scripts seemed to have been kept by the theatre troops and not entered wider circulation. Only from the end of the second century onwards is there evidence that dramatic scripts became more widely available and that people not involved in the theatre business were able to get access to written versions of dramas. For instance, in the first century BC, Marcus Tullius Cicero, the famous orator, politician and philosopher, includes allusions to dramas in his speeches. And he seems to assume that audiences are familiar with them as they have watched or read them or have done both. Here you can see some of his references to watching plays or generally just to plays um, uh, 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 as such. That familiarity with early Republican literature was not restricted to Cicero is shown by the fact that he frequently does not mention the names of playwrights or the titles of the pieces, or only quotes the beginning of a line or passage, explicitly or implicitly assuming that addressees or readers will recognize these quotations and know what follows, which um, you can see in the second example on this slide. Moreover, Learning Pacuvius's tragedy Toika instead of the text of laws by heart, a possibility Cicero envisages in the last extract on this slide, only makes sense if scripts of plays, uh, if scripts of the place text are widely accessible and people can read it and then learn it off by heart. The second half of the second century is also the period when scholars started to approach questions of literary history, when they obviously have access to written text. Hence, the beginning of reading dramatic scripts coincides with the beginning of philological work on them, which leads to, the, to an appreciation of the literary potential of drama. Those early scholars in the second and first century BC gathered texts, prepared editions and commentaries, discussed questions of order, authorship, assess the various writers and assemble details of theatre history. For instance, they discuss which of the many plays circulating under Plautus' name could be regarded as genuine. The genre of drama then remains a relevant entity in literary circles during the late Republic and beyond. In the area of literature, drama, particularly tragedy and comedy, exerts an influence on other poetic genres as the work of later poets such as Lucretius, Catullus, and Virgil demonstrate, who refer explicitly or implicitly to the early playwrights. Simultaneously, regular dramatic performances continued until the middle of the first century BC. In this time of the late Republic, it became possible to exploit revival performances of familiar plays for new and topical contexts. Such an adaptation is an interesting phenomenon of reception. And the transfer is so obvious that it does not necessarily compromise attempts at interpreting the original play 
and rather as a secondary reading in addition. A good example for such use of existing plays is Cicero's report about dramatic performances taking place after, he was uh, after it was agreed to recall him to Rome, which he had had to leave for political reasons. Among other details in this lengthy report, Cicero says, and since the cause of my speech has brought me to this point, the actor wept over my misfortune again and again, while he pleaded my cause with so much grief that this magnificent voice of his was hindered by tears. Nor were poets whose talents I have always appreciated lacking in my situation. And the Roman people showed their approval to this, not only by applause, but also by groaning. Should Aesopus, an actor then, or Accio as a poet, rather have said this for me, if the Roman people were free, or the foremost men in the community. In Brutus, I was mentioned by name, Tullius, who established liberty for the citizens, on cause of this line were requested countless times. Did the Roman people seem to be not firm enough of the view that I and the Senate had established what ruined citizens accused us of having removed? This scenario refers to a revival performance of Accius's history play entitled Brutus, which dramatizes the expulsion of the Roman kings and the foundation of the Republic by someone called Brutus, as, as it was performed by the famous actor Aesopus. This play by Accius apparently includes a line commenting on a Roman king named Servius Tullius. And because the line does not mention the king with a full name, it is possible to refer the statement to Marcus Tullius Cicero, as these two people share one part of their name. And then it is transferred to the current situation and the line is interpreted as emphasizing that it is Cicero who ensures liberty for his fellow citizens rather than his opponents. Although of course, originally the line refers to someone completely different. Irrespective of this interpretation of the line against uh, its original meaning in the context of the drama, the passage shows that Accius's play includes mention not only of the last Roman king Tarquinius Superbus, as attested by another fragment, but also of the penultimate one, who was regarded as a good and just king and apparently described as such. Such uh, information illustrates the political dimension of the play, which is not unusual for a history play, and perhaps made it even easier to transfer the meaning of that play to someone else in the current situation. Confirmation that uh, Accius's Brutus had a strong political dimension is relevant in connection with another known revival of Accius's Brutus. This time, however, only a planned revival. According to reports again in Cicero and other works, a performance of Accius's Brutus was planned for a festival in 44 BC, soon after the assass assassination of Gaius Julius Caesar. However, a brother of Mark Antony, who at that point had the political office responsible for organization of the festival, then replaced this historical drama with a mythical tragedy by Accius his drama theorize. Yet, as Cicero says, even that performance led to reactions from the audience. Though it is unclear to what extent these reactions have to do with the content of the play, or rather the overall situation. But the fact that Mark Antony and his brother didn't want a performance of Brutus, as I say, suggests that it could be read in quite a topical political way. These reports demonstrate that the theater remained a productive venue for engaging with drama to which both performances, performers and audiences contributed. It is only that a proportion of all performances were revivals of well-known plays, the productive role of the theater changed. It was not so much that audiences needed to be attracted to the theater by the promise of new and exciting dramas. Instead, organizers, performances and audiences knew what to expect. As Cicero notes in this period, some connoisseurs so sensitive, were so sensitive to music that as soon as a musician stroke up the first bars, they would recognize the song or play and knew which one it was. 
Thus, organizers, performers, and audiences could give place or, pl or parts of place an additional meaning in the contemporary context, or could try to avoid a transfer of the place content to the current situation by not putting it on or ha by having it performed in a particular way. The active tradition of producing new dramas for regular festivals basically ceased at the end of the Republican period, presumably due to changes in conventions and audience tastes. While revival performances and the production of pieces without a complex plot continued for a while, this development apparently meant that interest in the early plays faded and their transmission as complete script was discontinued at some point, so the precise time is difficult to determine. Thus, modern knowledge of details of early Roman dramas depends on what other ancient authors saw or say about them, while the later of these authors might no longer have taken their information from the original scripts. Among the later ancient authors transmitting information, two groups can broadly be identified. On the one hand, there are writers like Cicero and other scholars in the first century BC, who typically quote longer passages and incomplete sense units since they engage with the content of the excerpts. Their comments on the content might be determined by their own argumentative aims and their interpretation of the plays, rather than informed by what playwrights might have originally have intended, and they might misquote text if they reproduce them from memory or integrate lines into their own writing and thus adjust structures. On the other hand, there are late antique commentators, lexicographers, and scholiasts who quote passages for interesting linguistic phenomena, usually unchanged and with no further agenda other than producing an illustrative example. They do not always provide complete sense units, and the textual transmission of the works of these authors is often problematic. As a result of this situation, for some playwrights and plays, information is only provided by one of these quoting groups, depending on topic and popularity. And for some plays, there's a mixture of evidence from both sources. This limited, selective and mixed basis of information has led to a lot of speculation among scholars about the text of individual fragments and the plot of entire plays over the course of scholarly history. For instance, from the comedies of Gnaeus Naevius, apparently the most successful comic playwright before Plautus, information about a comedy called Ariolus the Soothsayer is transmitted. Two fragments survive, which you have on the screen in front of you. In the translation in the Lope edition, there are, but if you should offer a bit to the bite of a luncheous line, quoted to illustrate the meaning of bit, and a piece of a conversation where one person says, who dined with you yesterday? The other one says, guests from Praeneste and Lanuvium, two places in Italy. And the other person then there says, it, it would have been just the thing to have both parties entertained with their favorite fare. To the one, you should have given a little sauce belly, drawn and boiled, while for the other, you should have split out nuts at downhill speed, quoted to illustrate the phrase Praenestine nuts. That's all we have from this play. And as it happens, both fragments seem to deal with ways of eating and with eating specific things. Hence, one may be tempted to assume that this theme is a major aspect of the plot in the play. This may be the case. It is equally possible, however, that these two comments are in no way related, that they each represent remarks in particular contexts, perhaps for comic effect, and that they are of no particular importance for the plot as a whole. Unfortunately, it's simply not possible to determine which of these scenarios applies. This example therefore shows how suggestive perceived similarities between a random selection of fragments might be, but also how cautious one has to be to follow these, uh, uh, these, scenario, this, these potential scenarios. At the other end of the spectrum, the early poet Quintus Ennius who wrote a tragedies, comedies, history plays, a historical epic, satires, and other works, and was regarded as Father Ennius and the true founder of Roman, Roman literature by some Romans, was a very known figure in antiquity, and some of his plays seem to have become really famous. For instance, his tragedy Medea is quoted a lot. It was modeled on, this, uh, on the tragedy by, of the same title by the Greek playwright Euripides, which is set in Corinth, 
and appears to have been so well known that the opening lines, which is extract two on this slide, are quoted frequently by a range of authors, often even without mention of the author or the title of the play from which they are taken, since it is assumed that identifying the source of the quotation is not necessary. Moreover, from this play, a large number of fragments survive, so that along with pointers provided by Euripides' play, it is possible to get at least a sense of the potential plot. This situation has led earlier scholars to reconstruct the plot of Ennius tragedy in detail, assuming that it was broadly identical with Euripides' extant version. With regard to those passages, however, that are long enough to allow comparison, it is obvious that there are subtle differences between the Greek and the Latin versions. For instance, the organization of a speech might follow different principles, or there are more obvious allusions to Roman ideology and values in Ennius' play. In particular, the fragments surviving for Ennius' play include one that asks someone to contemplate Athens. That's the first extract here. Such a scene does not feature in Euripides' play, as it does not have any section set in Athens. Therefore, some earlier scholars have assumed that Ennius may have written two plays featuring Medea, one following the plot of the accent piece by Euripides, and another one possibly based on a lost piece by Euripides. Modern scholars generally no longer posit two different plays, and rather tend to assume a single play by Ennius and Medea, which differs from the Greek play in some respects. Whatever the true situation is, this situation should caution against the view that Latin plays can be recovered by reconstructing them on the basis of presumed Greek models. Cicero, at the bottom of the screen, does attest that Ennius Medea is based in Repetit's version, and this is true in a general sense, but does not provide full information about details of the plot. And, and Cicero says in the same breath that it's still worth reading as a piece of literature in its own right, which suggests some original contribution. Indeed, while Greek parallels are helpful for getting a sense of the underlying story, one has to stay open-minded and flexible and explore a range of possibilities for the Roman plays, which may be more or less similar to Greek pieces. Comparable issues occur on a smaller scale where one has to choose between different readings without being clear about the context. Another fragment from Ennius, which some have attributed to his tragedy Arechthois, and which is transmitted by the Virgilian commentator Servius, uh, reads uh, as you can see uh, here on the screen. In Warmington's translation from the Loeb edition, slightly adapted, that means that our children shield you in fall and fall in death's way for your own life's sake. The problem here that in the first line of the fragment, the main manuscript of the text of the transmitting author has Nostri, our, and a corrected version of this manuscript has Vestri, your. In combination with possible adaptations of the other pronouns in these verses, this has led to a number of potential versions. While some editors introduce a conjecture, which is a problematic method if the context is not known and the transmitted text can be construed to make some sense, others choose one of the transmitted versions, which yields a plausible sense with uh, all pronouns in the second person. Someone says to a group of people that their children defend them and die for them. Another group of editors chooses another transmitted version, and that's the one quoted here, which gives a slightly unexpected sense. Someone says that their own children defend and die for others. Situations in which could be said might be envisaged, and because this is a less obvious statement, it could be regarded as a so-called lecture difficilio with a manuscript having been corrected to produce a more straightforward version. Therefore, the more perplexing variety might be preferable, but a definite decision is impossible in the absence of further context. Hence, while it is tempting to draw conclusions on Roman attitudes from such a fragment, one has to be cautious once again, since the basis is uncertain. Again, one can only explore a range of possible hypotheses and as assemble the arguments for and against the various versions. These examples could be multiplied with instances from other plays and playwrights. 
but the material presented so far should be sufficient to illustrate the main issues affecting the transmission of early Roman drama, as well as the consequences for scholarship and literary history. Later extant texts clearly show that scholars and writers in the first century BC and AD, in the time which is usually regarded as the classical period of ancient Roman literature, were familiar with early Roman Republican plays and engaged with them. While they apparently regarded the very first Latin plays composed by the pioneers as somewhat crude, the later ones were seen as literary compositions in their own right, worth engaging with by means of quotations, allusions, or scholarly investigation. Therefore, since influential writers of classical Latin literature were familiar with the early stages of Roman literature and engaged with it, it is important for modern scholars to be aware of the beginnings and get a sense of their characteristics so as to be able to assess features of later Roman literature appropriately as they may go back to the early phases. Because of the transmission situation for some genres of Roman literature, it is not possible to get an objective view of the early stages unaffected by the opinions of later authors, since only through their engagement with this material does it survive at least in excerpts. Accordingly, Modern scholars must be extremely self-aware and methodologically conscious, be aware of circular arguments, constantly question their assumptions, and be clear about the basis of certain views. For instance, it is important to take the contexts in which fragments are quoted into account, since they might provide additional information about the text, for instance, the play they are coming from, and indicate intentions of the quoting author, which might again reveal something about the status of the piece within its original context. At the same time, one must not accept the aims of the quoting author, and rather look at each fragment in its own right and be open to all options, including that fragments could come from any point in the plot and be of major or minor importance. The process is further complicated by the fact that some fragments have been transmitted in rather corrupt form, and potential emendations are not only guided by grammatical and metrical considerations, but also by presumed views of the context. Before one now despairs completely and concludes that it is impossible to gain an understanding of early Roman literature, one has to acknowledge that the survival of these fragments needs to be valued, since they enable modern scholars to get a sense of the material. Even with the selectivity and the corruptions in the transmission, extant fragments give insight into the language used at the time and the themes aired in the plays. The comments of later authors provide information about an element of reception of these texts, and while plots often cannot be recovered, the recurrence of specific motives and a sample of fragments collected randomly enable some understanding of what themes may have been of relevance to playwrights and audiences at particular times. Thus, it is worth making the effort of extracting as much information as possible and as unbiasedly as possible from the transmitted material, so that the early influential and undoubtedly formative stages of Roman literature can be given their due weight in the assessment of the development of literature in ancient Rome. Thank you very much. <laughs>